David's best known for his pioneering work on blood stem cell mobilization and transplantation. He's an ARC Future Fellow uh, who's developing bioreactor systems. Today we'll be hearing about blood stem cell niche and expansion technologies. Would you please welcome David? <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Robert, very much for the kind invitation to come on and talk today. Um, so I'm going to give a, a, a presentation of, of one of the two, um, a sort of link presentation with Lawrence Mayer, a colleague of mine from CSIRA, and essentially sort of telling you a little bit about the work we've uh, done as part of the CRC for Polymers activity. And my brief, really, in my presentation is to set the scene and hopefully convince you by the end of this about the underpinning rationale for creating smart surfaces for expanding human body stem cells. So I'm going to try and convince you as to why we want to do this, what the biological reasons for that are, and maybe uh, present you with some of the difficulties and challenges in attending factors, the sort of interactions that uh, can be used to manipulate these cells, the growth factors that regulate them, um, both at the transcriptional level. We've got a number of really, really good in vivo models that can be used to assess the function of human body stem cells. But we really don't know much in comparison about where these cells reside within the bone marrow. And particularly this sort of concrete or well-defined anatomical location called the niche, which is really responsible for their regulation. So <coughs> I'm going to introduce this by just showing you, if you like, um, the challenge here. So this is a section of the mouse femur, starting with H and E. The bone is in pink there. The central vein which runs through the mouse femur, and all the other material, all the other cells that are stained with the HMA are essentially hematopoietic cells. Hematopoietic stem cells represent about 0.01% of all the nucleated cells in the bone marrow. So the challenge in trying to identify the niche is firstly finding out where these cells might reside, then that might give us insights about you know, what would be responsible in those locations for regulating them. <coughs> So fundamental for this, there's a whole lot of biology that needs to be done. So we'd like to address some questions. Where is the stem cell niche? Is there only one niche which is responsible for regulating input stem cells? There's been recent sort of conversations in the literature about at least two niches, a vascular and a so-called bone or endosteal niche. What cells within these areas comprise the niche? And how does those cells and the extracellular matrix components of the niche really regulate stem cells? Once we have this knowledge, then we might be able to think about rebuilding or creating an artificial environment which really could control stem cells as they are in vivo. If we could do that, will it actually work? So to address the first question in terms of where is the hemopoietic stem cell niche, a colleague of mine some years ago developed a really elegant tracking system which could really tell you where transplanted hemopoietic stem and stem and progenitor cells went following a, a transplantation into a, into a mouse. So the way these experiments were performed were taking <coughs> bone marrow from a mouse, basically by flow cytometry sorting stem and progenitor cells, labelling those cells with a tracking dye, in this case a, a fluorescent tracking dye, CFSC, injecting them back into recipient mice without any conditioning or ablation, and then at some time later, hours later, basically confusing the animal, removing the femur, and then cutting sections to see where the transplanted CFSC bright cells lodge within the microenvironment. This would give us some insights as to where the hemopoietic stem cell niche might be. And when Susie Nielsen, who developed this technique, did this, this these are the sort of results that she observed. You can see here some of these bright green CFSC tag cells in the marrow, and this like, situation is actually distant from bone, from here, it's really close to the bone, bone marrow interface, the so-called endosteal region within the bone marrow. So she was able to score, based on location in sections, whether cells that were transplanted were endosteally located or centrally located. And then she mapped the distribution of these cells um, depending on whether they were stem or progenitor cells. And this graph shows you here where cells lodge within the endosteal region as a function of time after transplantation. And what you can see here is if you look at the open circles first, the cells which are sorted based on progenitor markers really don't have any strong preference to go anywhere within the bone marrow. It's almost a random distribution. But if you look at the ones that are more primitive, which have expressed primitive HSC markers, they have a 
an active and a strong bias to seek the industrial region and the bone marrow. So this is the first evidence that hemiplex stem cells might really like to live in the industrial region. So since then, there's been a number of publications, in fact, quite a few, which <coughs> have confirmed this to show that the industrial location is really critical in terms of where the HSCs reside. So there were two sort of really key publications in, in 2003 from different groups which showed that the industrial region, particularly osteoblasts, were really important in regulating stem cells, hemopoietic stem cells. And this is just one of those publications that describe this particular population of cells, these spindle-shaped, incoherent, positive, 45 negative osteoblasts, which line the bone surface, and through their expression of incoherent and a homotypic interaction with incoherent on the hemopoietic stem cells, is really important in regulating those cells in that location. The same edition of uh, Nature, David Scadden's group, also published that if you manipulate the number of osteoblasts in the malaria microenvironment by, by delivering parathyroid hormone, you could upregulate the expression of a cell surface protein, a notch ligand jagged one, and that resulted in increased numbers of hemopoietic stem cells. So those two publications back to back really did demonstrate very nicely that the osteoblast, and particularly the industrial location, is probably very important for stem cells. So the message from their work and work of others which followed really shows that you know, stem cells exist in these defined little locations for, in particular the industrial region and they really don't live in isolation, they're in direct contact with a whole host of other cells really important in regulating those cells and also there are extracellular matrix components that are released by these cells and so understanding exactly what's in this mix would be where we go to actually try and build an artificial human body stem cell niche. <clears throat> so to sort of inform us more, we started asking questions about stem cells that we could isolate from different regions within the bone marrow, particularly those that were in the industrial region and those that were in the more central region after transplantation. So this shows you a part of an experimental design that we've used in, in mice to sort of address this. So one, when one typically harvests bone marrow from a mouse, particularly a mouse femur, what you do is essentially put a, a narrow gauge needle into the, into the end of the femur and you flush it through and you can pull the bone marrow out. And most people in the world actually <coughs> use this flush marrow harvesting method as the method of choice for collecting hemopoietic stem and regenerative cells. But what happens when you do that is you actually leave along the edge, this really critical location of the industrial surface, a large number of cells of which there are hemopoietic stem cells resident. So we've actively looked at the biology of cells that can be removed by flushing <coughs> and all the ones that remain at the industrial surface after that procedure. And ask questions about their biology and whether they're different or alike. And just cut to the chase, we've, we've published now two really important papers which we believe are important for the field, which describe um, for the first time that cells, hemopoietic stem cells that are located in the industrial region are functionally different than the hemopoietic stem cells of identical phenotype isolated from the central bone marrow region. So the most recent one's just been published in blood, it's coming out in a couple of months, but essentially what we're able to do using a very discriminant hemopoietic stem cell phenotype, this is based on SLAM markers, CD150 and CD48, if you isolate the so-called LSK SLAM population, the 150 negative, 48 positive, sorry, 48 negative, 150 positive, 48 negative cells from either the industrial collected bone marrow or the central bone marrow and compare them directly in, in, in assays, you can observe significant differences in their function. Just to show you one of those, this is a homing assay, very similar to the assay that I described earlier where you where you actually fluorescently tag cells, inject them and measure where they go. If you directly compare the homing of the industrial slam positive stem cells with central slam positive stem cells, you see that the industrial located ones, the ones in red there, about 30 to 40 percent of those cells will home back to the marrow of a recipient mouse. Cells that have identical phenotype that isolated from the central bone marrow region, as shown over here in the open red circles, have a significantly lower mobility to home back to the bone marrow. Moreover, if you actually looked at where those cells reside after the homing event, where they go back to a central location, 
for an industrial location, you see that the ones that are harvested from the industrial region have a strong bias and preference to go back to the site from which they are harvested. So industrial stem cells go back to the industrium, whereas central ones prefer to go back to the central region. And that's just shown over here, the industrial versus the central cells. The ones in black <coughs> harvested from the industrial region, you know, 60% of those cells go back to the industrial region in 15 hours. So that is really quite profound in terms of understanding and highlighting the differences between the location of these environments which support hematopoietic stem cells. So what that means, there's something really special about this osteoblast location and how that actually signals to stem cells that are anatomically close to these cells. So there's a, an abundant literature about this. There's a number of important interactions that have been well described, and I've listed a few here. So it's well described now that osteoblasts and other cells within this location produce membrane-bound stem cell collector, for example, and that's able to signal and bind through the receptor, its receptor on the stem cell, CKID. Likewise, likewise with flip ligand, there's been some very interesting recent publications from Suda's group in Japan showing that osteoblasts actually produce thrombopoietin, and its concentration locally is very, very high, and it might have a really important effect in terms of its biology and regulating stem cells there. And this shows you some of their data, it's all very busy, but the important point is, <coughs> on these graphs, is this is the time after transplant. Zero is obviously the time of transplant, up to 80 days. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the recovery of patients that were given the expanded cells grown on the immobilised materials compared to the ones which were not given the expanded cells. So we're looking at absolute neutral counts, neutral recovery. I suppose the point to be made is over here, you see that the, the dotted line on each of these graphs is what's considered to be a safe level of neutrophils, 500. You see 20 to 30 days before you get a reasonable, a safe level of neutrophils in the people that receive core buds without expansion. <coughs> but in comparison, people that receive expanded core buds do much better. Their need for recovery is certainly much more rapid. So um, the future for, for us, we believe, is an extension of this type of work. But instead of just you know, um, physio-absorbing ligands on surfaces, basically being able to do this <coughs> combinations of signals on surfaces in defined concentrations being presented in the right way so they can engage with their receptors expressed on the stem cells and therefore hopefully deliver far greater stem cell expansion than, than the people in Seattle have recently observed. And we believe if, if we put the right ligands and the right combinations we'll be able to achieve this. So I'd just like to finish there and acknowledge uh, a whole host of people that behind the scenes have been contributing to this work. Um, firstly a whole host of colleagues uh, at the CSIRO, who are part of the CRC for Polymers team, uh, particularly Lawrence, who will be speaking this, next, uh, and also my colleagues that were formerly at the Australian Stem Cell Centre, who now also all work for CSIRO, uh, and particularly Susie Nelson and, and Joachim for the, the work in the tracking studies and the homing, looking at the, the outcomes of, of cells that have been isolated from different regions of the bone marrow, because that work is really give, giving us a lot of information about the uniqueness of those two microenvironments. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take some questions. That was a pretty fascinating talk, and I'm um, very encouraged by your constructive pathway forward to try and resolve this. There's a person, um, a group in Israel, um, Shulman Levenberg, who's been using PLGA scaffolds to grow cells on, you're probably familiar with, and she's coming to Australia in November to the AHMRC Congress. But what she does basically, and I'm curious to know how this might fit into your system, in order to enhance the attachment of cells, and I don't think she's worked on cardiac cells, on pancreatic beta cells, and on pluripotent stem cells, is she uses a combination of uh, fibroblasts and endothelial cells. Mm. They're not defined factors, mm. but it's the cells that she finds, and that's been published now, uh, that in fact if you actually put them on, you get far greater uh, functioning, proliferation, etc. So can I ask you, how, if that was to be applied in your situation, what the factors that you're describing, are they present in these cells? Or? Well, they probably will be, I'm sure. They, <coughs> we've elected not to use cells in these sort of expansion approaches or bioreactor systems, primarily because at the end of the day it's going to be difficult to regulate that as a process. 
and, and ensure reproducibility and the robustness of, of different cell populations that might act as feeders to support these cells. We think this is far 